Windows Server 2016 is already out. So let's start building our own lab environment with the new features that Windows 2016 has to offer. Hello friends, this is Nick from NLB Solutions and today I'm going to do something different. Uh, in the past, you all know that my channel was created about a year ago and when I started creating the videos, I've uh, tried to uh, add new things to the videos of course and uh, if something new is out, I try to um, add this into, into the mix so that the channel can be both helpful and uh, in, in troubleshooting and new versions of software to introduce new features that were uh, provided by Microsoft. So um, what I'll do is I'm going to start creating a um, video series uh, on the topic of Windows 2016 because you all know that uh, two days ago Microsoft officially released the final version of the product and you can see right here I have it already installed um, on one of my virtual lab machines but uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by creating uh, a brand new lab from uh, scratch uh, and I'm going to use uh, 2016 so I'm going to uh, be presenting some new stuff that uh, is, in is included in the new version of course uh, I'm going to learn a lot and I ho hope that uh, you're going to learn as well uh, so uh, let's start with the first video of the series which is going to be on how to install and do some additional and uh, initial configuration of your Windows server. So before starting to actually install the Windows, I just want to go through the minimal system requirements that Microsoft provided and I think this is a good, a good thing for you to look at before you go ahead and install the operating system in general. So um, for the processor they require a minimum of 1.4 GHz 64-bit processor which uh, of course nowadays most of the processor processors are 64-bit compatible and uh, it should be just fine if you if you plan to do this in a lab environment or if you plan to install the server on a uh, physical machine if you if you want uh, on the RAM side they've um, said that uh, a minimum of 512 megabytes is required but this is only for the core edition of the server if you want the server with desktop experience installation you need a minimum of 2 gigabytes of RAM so the next one is the storage and they say that the absolute minimum to install the operating system is 32 gigabytes but uh, you need to bear in mind that if you have uh, more than uh, for example 4 um, or 2 gigabytes of RAM the page file that is going to be created is going to take space as well so this is a good consideration um, for you to have. Of course the other requirements are really basic you need to have an Ethernet adapter uh, capable of at least a gigabit uh, throughput and um, you, you need to have a DVD or you, you can have a, you can install the operating system uh, through a USB uh, if you require. Uh, a minimum of um, re resolution that they give is uh, 124 to uh, 768 or higher and this is of course the minimum and keyboard and mouse which is uh, we all know that um, this is a requirement that we, we all need to, to have in order for us to install a server. So um, I already have uh, booted into the installation media of my Windows server and uh, basically the installation is pretty much the same as the other operating systems that uh, you have seen in the past. So in the first screen you will have the option to um, select a language. In my case I'm going to stick with uh, the uh, US English and the uh, keyboard uh, input uh, method is going to be US. So I'm going to click next. And uh, you have the option to install now or repair. I'm going to choose install now because this is a brand new installation of the product. So 
so we need to wait for the setup to load and in here you have the options for you to select so uh, with this evaluation uh, that I've downloaded from the TechNet um, evaluation um, I have the standard and the data center editions of the Windows Server 2016 and of course I have the only core versions and uh, desktop experience versions so for this um, uh, video I'm going to go ahead and install the desktop experience standard evaluation because I think this is the uh, the general one of course in the future I'm going to create a uh, core version of the product so we can um, we can see how this is done as well and um, of course depending on your environment and your requirements you may need to have the core version only because you think it's going to be more stable uh, as Microsoft recommends if you want stability go ahead and install the core version or if you want you can go with the desktop experience where you have all the GUIs available and you can uh, with two clicks of the mouse you can configure things uh, as usual so I'm going to click next and I'm going to accept the license terms if you want you can go ahead and read them uh, it, I think they are the general license terms, but if uh, something new has been added, maybe it's interesting for you or your company to read this before you install the product. So I'm going to click next. And the next window is the usual one if I want to upgrade my Windows or if I want to custom install. And as this is a brand new machine, it's uh, currently not partitioned at all, I've presented a 60 gigabyte uh, disk for me to install the product so what I'm going to do um, of course I can click next and it's going to basically create the uh, all the partitions It's going to create the system reserved space uh, for the master boot record and so on but in this case I'm going to click new and I'm going to use all the space and it's going to warn me that it's going to need this uh, system uh, reserved space and in most cases it's around 500 megabytes there it is so um, my partition um, one is system reserved and my partition two is the um, space that is going to be used for the operating system to be installed so I'm going to click next and from here we all know this is the basic installation of a normal Windows uh, server or a um, it's pretty much the same as a desktop as well so I'm going to pause the video right here and I'm going to wait for the uh, installation to finish and I'm going to resume so we can see what is the next step in the configuration that we need to do so after the installation is finished I'm going to click restart now and I'm going to wait for my virtual machine to boot up once again and there you go the Windows Server 2016 is booting up. It looks the same as the Windows 10 operating system boot, um, boot screen in general. And we all know that from the past, uh, most of the server operating systems are, well, let's say not really well uh, configured when they are first released. So I'm really hoping this one is going to change something with it, with, with this thinking. Because if I remember correctly, the Windows 2008 version and 2012 were not as good as the R2 versions. So we'll see how it goes um, in the future and uh, how are things going to behave. So after configuring the devices, it did another restart and I'm waiting for the um, initial um, account um, screen to appear for me to add a password for my admin account so let's see so there it is I'm going to set a password for my administrator account and now I have the login screen which is pretty much the same login screen as the um, yes of course it looks the same as Windows 10 so I'm going to press Control Alt and delete and I'm going to log in as administrator for the first time okay uh, so it's going to create my profile and I'm going to be able to see the normal um, 
login screen, which of course includes uh, additional features uh, for the Windows Server. So um, pretty much this um, is how you can install the Windows 2016 server from scratch. And it's a really fast process. Uh, it's easily done, easily achieved. So uh, the next thing that I want to do, I want to show you, is how to configure some um, initial settings that I I configure when I um, install a brand new server. So I went ahead and fixed the resolution because I know that uh, most of you guys are really annoyed when the resolution is not that good. But uh, please note that in a lab environment, uh, I need to. Um, or it's not possible for me to have a better re resolution so I can show you the installation process but as soon as the operating system starts up and everything is okay I always try to fix that so it can be m better for the viewers so um, the first thing that I want to and I uh, have to do is configure the local server that I've installed so what I do is I open the server manager and basically it pops up when you start the operating system and you log in and I go to the uh, local server and in there it's really good to have all the uh, features, all the all the things that I want to configure on this server into one place. And I start from the bottom or from the top to the bottom and configure them one by one. For example, I uh, start with uh, changing the computer name. So um, I want to change the computer name. So it's this is a generic one. I'm going to change it to NLB dash DC dash zero one because this computer is going to be my first domain controller that I'm going to promote in my environment. So um, this is going to be configured in a future series. Um, I'm going to close this window and I'm going to click restart later because it will need to restart in order for the um, name change to take effect. The next thing, it's always good to um, check the firewall, but this is a, a thing that uh, needs to be checked after the domain controller is promoted. It's always good to check and verify that your private networks and guest or public networks, uh, the firewall is on and working. And for your domain firewall, I always try to turn it off because I don't want any communication to be blocked. Because I know that Microsoft are uh, trying to um, and basically are saying that the domain network's firewall should not block anything, but I just want to be sure. So what I do is when I promote a domain controller or when I have a member server, I try to disable this um, in order for me to, um, as, as a precautionary method of troubleshooting, let's say. So the next thing is the remote management and remote desktop. You can see that uh, my remote desktop is already enabled. From here you can enable remote desktop so you'll be able to connect to the server via RDP. And this option is um, set to do not allow remote connection to this computer by default. But I click it to allow and uh, only secure uh, using the network level authentication. In here you can add additional users that will be able to make uh, a remote desktop to this server but uh, the administrator account which is the local admin already has access. So the next thing that I usually configure is because you want your uh, server to be where you want it to be and to be static. Uh, what I usually do is I change the DHCP IP address to a static one because you all know that um, if you use a DHCP assigned address um, your resources that you are going to use on the server can be well in different places let's say that way because today um, the DHCP can give an IP address uh, of uh, 192.168.1.1 tomorrow it can that address will not be available and it will give uh, a different address. Of course, you can you can make a reservation for for the server, but it's always a good thing to have a server with a static IP address. You can achieve this by opening the pro properties of the Ethernet uh, card, going to the Internet Protocol version four, and uh, select the radio button uh, button. Use the following IP address and add the information in here. 
So as I've already configured this, the next thing that I go through is the uh, updates. Of course, you can configure the updates to uh, uh, to different different options. Let's say, so uh, if you want your server to be to install updates automatically, of course, you can always select this option. Or um, if you if you have any restart options, you can you can configure them in here. If you want uh, your server to install only selected updates, uh, it's always a good idea to to change the settings so that um, the the server will only check for updates and not install them. In here, I'm not able to see that it's going to check. Uh, for updates nevertheless, but I'm pretty sure that if I install WSUS and I control the updates from there, uh, it will not go ahead and install them um, where I don't want. So, the next thing is uh, the Windows Defender. Currently the uh, protection is on, which is good. Of course, uh, you can always check the Windows Defender and do some additional configurations. I hope that uh, the Windows Defender will not block any packets that it detects as malware because this can be really troublesome if you have, for example, a third-party application and your Windows Defender uh, starts acting strangely, blocking connections to the application and uh, you end up um, with a lot of complaints from, from your customers. Uh, the next one is the feedback and diagnostics. You can configure them from here, and of course you can configure the um, the time. But uh, if you if you connect to the internet, of course it will um, try to uh, check for the for the time from the from the internet, and it will configure all the settings. But from here you can change the time zone to the time zone that uh, you're currently located in. So I'm going to change mine. OK, and I'm going to click OK to this. And of course, this is the last step, but it's really, really important one. You have the product ID and uh, in here uh, you can set the product ID for the operating system. What I usually do is I activate the product uh, when the server is fully operational because I don't want to activate a product that I'm not really sure that is going to work fine because as you know uh, not all of the installations can go how we like them to go and um, in the end you can um, be left with an activation of Windows Server that you're going to decommission. So uh, this is how you do the basic configuration, the initial configuration of a Windows server, at least these are my steps that I do. The only thing that uh, is left for me to do is just restart the server so it can pick up the new name and um, let's do this and end up the video. So after the restart, my server is booting up once again, it's going to load the server manager and I'm just going to confirm that under the local server I have the new name that uh, I desire. So I'm just waiting for it to load up and there it is, the nlb-dc-01. So um, this friends is how you install the new server 2016. I might say that there is no, there is nothing new for, for you to be afraid of. The installation process from scratch is pretty simple, it's pretty fast and uh, elegant. So the next, in the next video of the series, I'm going to continue with promoting this server to my first domain controller. So we can see how the process uh, has changed from 2012 to 2016. If you have any comments, you can always put them in the comment section below. If you have any problems, you can always ask the questions and I will try to answer them as soon as possible. And um, if you like the video, of course, you can subscribe to the channel. I'm going to release new videos uh, from the 2016 series starting from today. So there is there are a lot of interesting things that we are going to go through. Uh, this long road of installing and configuring the Windows 2016. Once again, this was Nick from NLB Solutions. Thank you very much for viewing and see you soon.